so hello everyone, uh, my name is Maria, and today I will be talking about the power of prototyping. Let me start with a short introduction. Uh, I am a senior delivery manager at Epsilon, which in practice means that I am supporting our clients in creating new products or enhancing tools that already exist. Uh, and I'm working mostly with big uh, corporations uh, where we are creating internal tools for their teams. And one of the most important aspects of my job is to support our team to create successful tools. And for me, a tool is successful if, first of all, it is being used. Because only if this first condition is met, we can talk about your product bringing value. And today, I will be talking mostly from my own personal experience. And I would like to start with a short story. Uh, you can see a spoiler here. It won't be a success story. Um, and it started as a typical project. So, and there was a manager who had this great idea for a new uh, tool that he wanted to introduce for his colleagues. And he started development on his own. Um, around after a year, he realized that he would need some help from more experienced developers to fix a few bugs and also implement uh, more complex features. Um, so he decided to contact us. We started working together, uh, but he was our only point of contact. So he was the one deciding on the priorities. Uh, he was also validating our work. Um, so this is why we asked him a few times if it would be possible for us to talk with the users, you know, mostly to understand the product better, but also uh, maybe to suggest some improvements. But uh, this manager was very hesitant about it. So he always repeated, not yet, you know, let's finish this one additional functionality, or oh, let's improve this one small feature. Um, so we continued the development. And uh, after additional three months, we released the first version of the application. And only then uh, we started talking with the users. We were able to meet with them uh, to see how they are interacting with the application and also ask them a few questions. And um, as a result of those meetings, we prepared a report. Here you can see the result of this report. So nine out of 10 people had problems with usability. And in the end, they told us that they won't be using the application in the current state. On the next slide, you can see a few more detailed comments, but they're quite similar. So people were mentioning that the app is overcomplicated and it is very hard to use it without proper training. So after over a year of development altogether, we created something that people were not going to use. So as you can guess, the project was closed and the app was never really on the production. Uh, so of course, after a project like this, we started asking ourselves, you know, what could we have done better? And the first answer that we had is that we should probably talk with the users sooner. So of course, even before contacting us, this manager could have some talks with the users. He could just, you know, deploy the first version of the application and ask them to provide feedback. But, you know, maybe also we could be more pushy when asking for contact with the users. Um, so that's why currently when I'm uh, starting any project, this is the one phrase that I'm trying to follow and I'm trying to convince you know, all of the clients to release as fast as possible. And to be able to do this, you need to start simple. So for me, the best way uh, to be able to release fast is to start with a prototype. And when I say prototype, uh, I mean the first version of your application with only a few main functionality fully developed. Uh, but it is important here to focus on the default user path. So whenever you have your business case, you know, just focus on the one main thing you want your users to be able to do in your application and then, uh, you know, strip it out of everything else. There are, of course, some things that can be mocked to just show to the users that it is possible to implement it, but it does not need to be fully functional. Uh, because only then you can have something that you can show to your users in just a few weeks rather than a few months. And now some of you may ask me, what is this amazing tool that you are using to have prototype in just a few weeks? Uh, and in our case, especially for data-driven applications, Shiny would be uh, the tool that we are using. There are probably many reasons that uh, a lot of people from Shiny team could share, but for us it is, first of all, the fact that you can prototype very fast. So you don't need to have any web development knowledge. It is enough to know R and Shiny will take care of everything else for you. Uh, the second point is that you have a lot of out-of-the-box packages like BSLib that was just presented. Um, and also there are even ready-to-use templates that you can download. Like on our Epsilon webpage, you can find some of them and then there can be your starting point. Uh, another point 
is that you can deploy very fast uh, in Shiny. It's very easy to deploy your app, especially if you have Posit Connect, then it's just one click of a button, but there are also alter alternatives there. Uh, and the last point that, in my opinion, is underappreciated is the ease to show the real data. And of course, on one side, you have a lot of ready-to-use components that are uh, allowing you to create uh, you know, an interactive application that your users can use to, um, ex to explore the data, but also we can pre-process the data directly in R. So you don't need to have any additional tools, and we all know that usually when we are starting our project, the data is not perfect and it needs some cleanup uh, or modifications. And I would like to focus a bit more on this last point and tell you why uh, I think that you know, it is important to show the real data to the users when you are even just prototyping. Just let me. So first of all, <coughs> it allows the users to focus on the functionalities rather than discussing the data in accuracy. Uh, so I've been in a situation that I had to present the prototype with only mock data. And it still brought value, but we spent a lot of time discussing why this 15 is not 17. And even if I explain to the users that the data is mocked, then you know, I had to explain myself when do I, where, where do I plan to take the data from. So in the end, they were just focusing on this one part. Uh, another point is that it is just easier to compare to the current process. So whenever you are introducing a new tool in your organization, you are probably trying to support or even replace a uh, process that already exists, uh, even if this is just you know, sending an Excel file to your manager. But then um, if you are showing the users the same data in both places, they can easily compare uh, those two ways of doing the same task and give you a better feedback. And the last point is that um, it allows to select the best way to present the data. So we, we all know that if we would use some uh, default um, sets like Iris, you know, your data will look probably decent. But then when you're starting to using production data, it may um, differ a lot. So one of the examples I have is that we created a big table in one of my projects with uh, rows and cells colored based on some business logic. And it looked very well with the mock data. We were very happy with it. But then when we started using the production data and like the colors were all over the place, it was just not possible to read this and we had to completely redesign uh, this feature. So let's now assume that you know, we were able to build a prototype. We are even able to uh, show the real data. So what is next? So next we need to start talking with the users. And today I'll be talking about uh, two ways of gathering user feedback that worked best in my projects. Uh, so I'll start with user interviews and then I will go to user workshops. Uh, so when I say user interviews, I mean a set of one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, between the users and the interviewer. And here it is important, uh, first of all, for the meetings to be really one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, because only then the user can fully focus on the uh, application and also, you know, uh, answer honestly for questions. So if his manager is in the room, it will be a bit more difficult sometimes uh, to do so. Um, the second point is that um, the user has to interact with the application. So this is not us showcasing the app and just explaining new features. It is just sending a link to a user and asking them to perform some actions. Um, and it is good to keep the instructions as simple as possible. Uh, so for example, avoid saying something like, could you please go to the page three and just edit data in the row four. It is much better to focus on this business aspect. So for example, asking something like, uh, could you please uh, modify the number of chamomile shampoos in the magazine in Chicago in November? Because then you can see how easy or difficult it is first for the user to find the information about this chamomile shampoo, but then also to modify it. And uh, another point is to uh, limit the explanations to minimum. And it may be challenging at first, especially if you see people struggling with the app, you know, you want to help them. But it is crucial to just observe and learn from it. Um, and the last point here is to remember to give opportunities to provide open feedback. Uh, so one thing that I'm always doing is uh, I'm asking the users to speak aloud about the thinking process. 
uh, because then they can you know, tell me not only what they are doing and why, but they are also sharing their expectations quite often. And this is a great source of information on what, how you can improve your application. And also after this first part of the interview, so after you know, the user stopped interacting with the application and performing those tasks, it is good to save some time to ask additional questions. Uh, and here the only rule is to just you know, avoiding suggesting the answer. Uh, so I would avoid questions like, you know, don't you think that this functionality is great or the most useful? It is much better to ask uh, you know, which of the functionalities is the most useful or even better, how um, often are you going to use different functionalities here? Uh, so this was this first part about those one-on-one -on -one meetings, user interviews. And now I will go to the second part about user workshops, um, which is a set of meetings with a larger group of users, uh, ideally five to seven, but I think 10 is still manageable. And all those meetings, people are working with the application individually. Uh, they are then sharing their experience, which is later discussed, and some improvements are suggested. Uh, and on those meetings, it is good to split into sessions focus on one functionality. Uh, here you can see um, an example agenda from like, a workshop I did a few months back. I just replaced the functionality names with placeholders. Um, and you may be surprised that for each functionality we uh, have all two hours um, dedicated. Uh, and uh, it may seem a lot, especially that those are quite simple things like editing the data or even filtering it, but uh, it was really needed. Uh, mostly because you know, a lot of happens during these two hours. So uh, first of all, there is some individual work. So we are sending the link to the users and we are asking them to, again, go through the app, to focus on this one particular functionality, to perform the tasks that they would normally do. Uh, and then I am also in the room answering questions, looking how they are interacting with the app. So it is quite similar to what I described before. Uh, but then during this process, they have time to note down some feedback that is later discussed, uh, prioritized, and then again discussed. So you can imagine that if there's like 10 people in the room, probably the discussion can take some time. Um, and another point is to give uh, an easy way to provide feedback. But you should also think about yourself here and to make it easy later for you to gather it and uh, summarize it. What we usually do is, uh, we are preparing for every separate functionality a board like this uh, with the things that uh, people liked in a given uh, functionality they didn't like, uh, the things that are missing and are obligatory, they have to have them for, to be able to use the app, and the things that are missing and you know, can be implemented later somewhere in the future. Um, what I also current, uh, usually started doing um, is that I also create another space called parking lot that people can add some you know, random thoughts that they had in mind just to not interrupt during uh, each session. And um, the last point is to save some time to prioritize. So after, um, every, uh, after all of the sessions, it is good to have additional one to just take, you know, uh, three to five cards from every uh, board like this, put them again in one place and prioritize them and discuss this prioritization. And this discussion is extremely important. So for example, I've been in a situation that, um, you know, after this exercise, I looked at the cards and I saw that something that I thought is super important based on the conversations was somewhere at the bottom. Uh, so I asked the users, uh, why uh, is this the case? And uh, they told me that this is obvious that it needs to be implemented. And it wasn't obvious for me. <laughs> so it would probably not be that obvious for the development team as well. Mm, that's why uh, I think this time to talk about it is very important. And usually the, the results of such workshops are just a report with a list of priorities and a short description about each priority. Uh, sometimes also if you can add some simple visual, uh, visuals that can help. Um, and this report is later also very useful during the development. So if you have reviews with the users, you can even go back to it. Uh, you can discuss it and show them that you are listening to them and uh, trying to implement the improvements. 
Um, and I told you at the start that um, user workshops and user interviews work best uh, in my projects. So now I want to just uh, defend it a bit. <laughs> so first of all, uh, it allows uh, for a detailed discussion, something that I mentioned, I think, a few times during this talk. But um, because of this, you can understand not only what people want you to do, but also why. And then you can you know, suggest some alternatives, but also you know, have a bigger picture and make sure that when you are designing a new feature, you are taking this into consideration. So both in the architecture, but also in the UX design. Another point is that uh, you need only five to 10 users, which I think it's not a lot. One thing to remember here is that this group should be diverse. So if you're building something you know, that should work across departments, probably you should have people from different departments, uh, the same from people from different regions. And uh, I would like to finish my talk with another story, this time a success story. And it started in the same way. So there was this manager with this big, amazing idea for a new tool that he wanted to uh, introduce in his organization. And he needed our help to develop it. So we learned from our experience. So even before starting a project, we talked with him to you know, be able to have some users involved in the process. Uh, but fortunately, uh, he was very open for this. He not only was talking with the users a lot about the product, but also he was open for us to have those discussions. What is more, he agreed to start with a prototype. So just after three weeks, we already had something that we could uh, present to the users and discuss with them. We decided to go with the user interviews um, because it was still when COVID was there. So we had to do it online. Uh, and uh, you know, the results of these interviews were not as horrible as the ones that I showed you before, uh, but we learned that one of the main functionalities um, is not working in a way that people are expecting it to work. Um, in the end, it wasn't a huge change from the UI perspective, but it was big enough change that we had to redesign the data architecture. So imagine this happening you know, five months into development. It would be a real big change that would influence a lot of features. Um, so we continued the development, and after just you know, additional five months, we were able to deploy uh, the first version of the application. And the feedback was very positive. People were excited about it. Uh, currently, the app is used by thousands of users, and uh, we are still adding new features. So to summarize my talk, if you want to build a new product and not go bankrupt, Involve the end users early on, release fast, and don't forget about using the real data. So if you want to talk more, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I would be happy to discuss uh, the projects that you are doing and also your challenges. Uh, and here I also wanted to thank uh, POSIT for inviting me and thank you all for joining here today. Thank you, Maria. Um, we have time for one quick question, which sort of aims at the advice to release fast. Do you have any advice on how to balance doing that in making a good impression? Uh, making a good impression? I think that the best, uh, like the best advice I would give is to just start with a group of users that you trust and you know that you know, will be open to seeing a tool that is not perfect. Uh, because in the end, it won't be, and it won't be. It will be buggy. It won't be using work perfectly. It probably won't be the prettiest if you want to use be asleep. So you can always, uh, you know, start with people that you trust and people that you know are open to seeing things that are not ideal. Thank you.